So we're going to continue our series, Gospel in the Psalms. Last week we started Psalm 53, uh, which is the well-known passage where it says, The fool has said in his heart, what? There is no God. And so, as usual, we're going to have a question and answer session at the end. So feel free to text your questions to this number on the screen here. And uh, anything about life or Psalm 53, or the Bible in general. Um, if it's a uh, an engineering question, you can send it to one of the other guys. I don't know anything about that. But Psalm 53, hopefully you can follow along with this in your Bible or on your device. And this morning we got a special treat. Ming is going to come. Her name, come on up here, Ming. Ming is actually, her full name is Ming Kwang Lee. Come on up here with me. Join me here. is going to read the scripture for us in Mandarin. So I'm going to let you stand here, and you can read it off that screen right there. Your opportunity you met the pastor, and right now I work in Baylor College of Medicine as a surgeon. And for the Alzheimer disease, yeah, I just uh, looking for the mechanism of Alzheimer. Use a uh, animal brain slice recording, look at the neuroscience into the brain. What's going on after Alzheimer or neuro neurodegeneration disease? Uh, yeah, the kind of biology. Oh, thank you. Sinotre 连一个也没有但愿以色列的救恩从西安而出神给他子民带来复兴的时候神给他子民带来复兴的时候或意神把他被掳的子民带回来的时候雅各要快乐以色列要欢喜Kathy is studying Chinese. Where's she at? Helping him. Did you understand any of that, Kathy? What did, what did she say? Oh, she's in the bathroom. Good timing there, Kathy. Way to go. Good job there. All right. So, um, you know what? Sometimes I get asked the question what language will we be speaking in heaven? You know what I've come to learn, I think, in the last year? And I'm not going to say I know for sure on this. But as I read Revelation, it says that standing before the throne was every tribe and tongue and nation. They still had their tongue. I believe you could be speaking whatever language you speak now. You say, well, how will we understand each other in heaven? The same way they did at Pentecost. They said every man heard that which was in his own language. So Peter could have got up and spoken in Hebrew, but everybody heard it in their own language. The gift of tongues was sometimes in the speaking, and sometimes it was in the hearing. So I believe in heaven we're going to understand all languages, but the Chinese will still speak Chinese, the Filipinos will still speak, now I stepped into it, 
Tagala. I know it's not Filipino. Okay, and, uh, and you rednecks will still speak hick. I mean, everybody's going to be speaking their own language in, in heaven. But in this passage right here, the, the heart of the matter is the fool says in his heart there's no God. I want you to know that he doesn't, it doesn't he says or he thinks there's no God. It's a matter of his heart because his brain is trying to rationalize that there's God, but his heart keeps telling him, yes, there is. Yes, there is. Look at creation. Yes, there is. Listen to your conscience. Yes, there is. Look at the Christ revealed in his word. Yes, there is. And you have to keep telling your heart, no, there's not. No, there's not. Your brain is having an argument with your heart because your heart keeps telling you that there, is, you that there is a God, but your brain is trying to rationalize him away. And rationalization is a rash of lies. And that's what you're doing. You're lying. Now, that is not to say that Christianity is not logical or philosophical because it is. But when the Bible says your heart, it means in the center of your being. It includes your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings, your will, and your volition. All those are included when the Bible says heart. It's not an emotional reference by itself. So, as I mentioned last week, but it's worth reviewing, especially if you weren't here, and I want you to understand this as you're sharing Christ, that you have to understand that there are two types of atheists. There is the scientific atheist who wants to say that he's looking at evidence, and he sees evolution, and he sees all these scientific things, and therefore uses that to explain away that the fact there is a God. But that in itself is not logical. If you look at this picture right here, in another solar system, in another galaxy, we have found a planet that looks a lot like Earth. Similar size, could have life. It's Kepler-186f. There it is right there. And it is in another solar system. The one problem that makes us think that it probably doesn't have life is it because it's, r it's near a red dwarf star that has such a strong gravitational pull that, the, that this planet probably barely rotates, if at all. Okay? And, of course, the rotation of the Earth has helped what contributes to life because we need the night and day cycle regularly. Otherwise, things burn up or freeze up or whatever it may be. So, but is it possible that there's life on Kepler-186f? It's possible. Now, I believe, from my worldview, that there's probably not. I believe in God's great scheme of things that he's made the, the universe so vast but put what life on one little tiny marble as a statement of, of this is all that matters to me, that I'm willing to die for this puny little planet. But I cannot scientifically say there's not life on that planet. So therefore, I cannot be the equivalent of an atheist and say there's no life on that planet. To make such a statement would be ignorant and not scientific. So how do we know that, how does the atheist know that God doesn't dwell on that planet? How can you say that there is no God? Because you don't know where everything is and what's going on in every other galaxy. So therefore, you must be an agnostic, if you're going to be honest. An agnostic says, I'm not sure if there is a God, but if there is, fill in the blank. So really, there are no true atheists because no one can know for certainty that there's not a God somewhere outside of your sphere of, of intellect. You can say that you're, you think there probably isn't, just like I think there's probably not life on this planet, but I can't say for sure. So the second type of atheist, though, is probably several that I'm speaking to this morning, including me, and that's the practical atheist, where we say, yes, there's a God, but we act like there's not. We make decisions every day without consulting him. And, of course, what does Proverbs tell us to do? In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. But we make decisions on our own path without acknowledging him. And guess what that makes us? A practical atheist. So there's Christian practical atheists who are born again and saved, but they act like they're not. And then there's people who believe in God, but they're not born again, and they're living every day, maybe giving a token acknowledgement to God, but truly they're, they're not acknowledging God in the deepest sense of the, se of, of the word. So, it says that the fool has says in his heart. And, I, and as I mentioned last week, I want you to get out of your mind this image right here of the fool. This is not the fool. If you want a more realistic picture of the fool, it's these guys. Okay? These guys are highly intelligent, but they're angry. And they're, they're angry at God. And it's interesting that they do not go on television blasting Buddhists. They do not go on television blasting the Islamic uh, community. 
They do not go on television blasting other religions. Why do they single out Christianity and blast the name of Jesus? Because he's the true and living God. And deep down in their hearts, they know it. And that's where the anger is coming from. So that's, that's the, that, so when you think of the fool, I want you to think of these guys right here. And again, I'm not saying this in a hateful way. We need to love and pray for these people, okay? And we need to pray for their followers because there's two types of fools. There is the fool who knows that what he's saying isn't right and he's leading others astray. The Bible calls those deceivers and false prophets. But there's the followers of those who are ignorant fools. They just don't know better. And there's a whole, there's literally millions of 19, 20, 21 year olds in colleges today being taught by these guys right here who are ignorant fools and they are following like the blind leading the blind. I want, I want, to under, I want you to understand this morning that their problem is what Romans chapter 1 says. Paul takes this psalm right here and he does an exposition of it and elaborates on it here. And he says, For although they knew God, they knew him because of creation. They knew him because of conscience. They knew him because of the light of Christ. They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but became futile in their thinking, in their intellectual, their education, their PhDs, their master's degrees, which all those are good if they're to the glory of God. But they, in this case, it's not. And, and their foolish hearts were what? Darkened. And see, that's where you are the light of the world to bring the light into the darkness. Watch this. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. It's when you think that you know, that's when the foolishness surfaces. What, the thing I want you to see this morning is that there, there, there's a lot of foolishness in the world, and we need to come against it. Last week, I, I read this quote here by Bill Murray. Religion is the worst enemy of mankind. No single war in history of humanity has killed as many people as religion has. We, pr- we debunked that last week. Stalin, Mao Zedong, Pol Pot, all atheists have killed a combination of about 120 million people in the last century. Think about that. Now, when he says that religion, he's talking about radical Islam for the last 1,500 years has killed a lot of people. But socialists and communists and atheists have killed more people in the last century competing with, with radical Islam. So that's a false statement. The second one that I didn't cover last week is he says, and I'm sorry if it's blurry, he says, not to mention it sets science back by a thousand years. Really? Christianity sets science back by a thousand years? Let's look at the facts. Who is this? This is Sir Isaac Newton. He's the father of modern physics. Without all the technology that you and I have, without a computer, without even a calculator, this guy changed science. And how did he do it? Because he believed in God. He said, he who thinks half-heartedly will not believe in God, but he who really thinks has to believe in God. Sir Isaac Newton got most of his ideas about science from the Word of God. And to this day, he is the father of modern physics. Let's look at somebody else here. Anybody? Who is this? Um, So here we go. This is Johannes Kepler, who that other planet was named after. When people looked up in the stars and they thought that the whole world, the whole universe revolved around the earth, he said, no, it doesn't. He said, based on the Bible, we know that the earth is not the center of the universe. And, and, he, and he could explain which, star, which were stars and which were planets and why they looked like they went in different directions. And he was able to chart all of how the planets in the solar system without modern technology. And for Johannes Kepler, belief in a brilliant creator who ultimately wanted his creation to be further discovered was a motivating factor in his work developing ideas about the laws of planetary motion. Kepler believed the design of the universe for which is his research is in the 1600s, helped further reveal, painted an even more detailed picture of the God of the Bible. Very smart man who set science forward a thousand years, not backward a thousand years. Anybody know it? Yes, good for you, Sir Francis Bacon. Good job. He was known for establishing and popularizing the scientific method. I mean, when we talk about... Uh, Observation, hypothesization, hypothesis. I'm trying to put them in the same adjective. But anyway, uh, collecting facts and then making an educated hypothesis, then testing that theory. That whole process was founded by this man. And listen about him. He was known for establishing and popularizing the scientific method. He viewed science as a way to learn deeper truths about God, 
arguing, and this is his quote, that a little philosophy inclines man's mind to atheism, but depth in philosophy brings men's minds about to religion. So he believed in God, and we know that Sir Francis Bacon didn't set science back a thousand years. He set it forward a thousand years. Who is this guy? Albert Einstein. Very good. Albert Einstein, I'm not claiming he's a Christian. He did not claim to be a Christian, but he did not. He definitely made it clear he was not an atheist, and he definitely did believe in God. And I'm going to give you several quotes. He said, the more I study science, the more I believe in God. You see, the big myth that's been told to us is that the more the technology is introduced, the less people will believe in God. That belief in God is, comes from superstition. That cavemen have to explain fire. That cavemen have to explain rain. And so therefore they make things up. That is the farthest from the truth. Do you realize with every invention that was a major advancement in technology, Christianity grew, not went backwards? Think about that. When the alphabet was created, the word of God became written. And belief in God increased. When when, when roads were made by the Romans, the Roman road, we talk, call them, the gospel spread because of that technology, not people, oh, wow, now we know science because look at all this information traveling so quickly. When the printing press was invented by who? Gutenberg. The Bible and the gospel spread like wildfire over the planet. And when people think, oh, well, now that we've got the Internet, everybody's going to know there's no God. We won't need that. With the Internet, Christianity is spreading to the deepest, darkest parts of the world faster than ever before. Religion is not going down because of technology and science. It's going up because of it, because it's in the hands of, of good people doing good things. So their whole idea that as we evolve and become more intellectual, Christianity and religion will go away has turned out to be f nothing more than false. He said science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. Science is on your side, believer. Science is on your side. There's no contradiction between science and faith, okay? The, faith is not blind. Faith observes and then believes what is seen to make sense. The, the, the visible explains the invisible. If I was to drop this piece of paper, the visible has just explained the invisible, which is gravity. I have faith that if I do that over and over again, it will fall to the floor over and over again because I've scientifically tested it. But I do not see gravity, but I have faith that it is there. Faith is uh, faith in, in what is unseen. Here's another Einstein quote. As a child, I received instruction both in the Bible and in the Talmud. I am a Jew, but I am enthralled by the luminous figure, figure, figure of the Nazarene. Who's he talking about? Jesus the Nazarene. No one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. Scientists will say Jesus is just a myth and a legend. One of the smartest men in the world says, no way. And yet you don't get these in your textbooks in school. The, the quotes about Albert Einstein believing in God are all over, but you will not get these in textbooks in any, most colleges and, de and definitely not in the schools. Say, well, Gary, those are all old guys. It's a long time ago. Why don't you give me some new guys? Because, you know, that was back then when everybody was religious. Oh, yeah, well, this is Francis Collins. Collins. He um, helped decode the human de genome, which is one of the greatest revelations of our time. You're now able to do, like, put spit in a bottle, and they can tell you what diseases might run in your family tree because of this guy and others like him. Listen to what he said. He said, in his best-selling 2006 book, The Language of God, Collins suggests that God is a master creator and designer responsible for setting forth events resulting in life. This is one of the smartest men in the world today, and he believes in God. Here's another one. Dr. Christian Amphenson, Nobel Prize for Chemistry, Biochemistry of RNA, which is ribonucleic acid, right? Um, John Hopkins University. Listen to what he said. Think that only an idiot, I think that only an idiot can be an atheist. He's, tell us what you really think, Dr. Alvinson. He said, we, we must admit that there exists an incomprehensible power or force with limitless foresight and knowledge that started the whole universe going in the first place. 
very intelligent Nobel Prize winner. And so we don't hear about these guys. We think that all scientists are atheists and nothing could be farther from the truth. Um, let's go to another guy. D.H.R. Barton, Nobel Prize Chemistry, Conformational Analysis in Organic Chemistry, an Aggie. Okay, so even Aggies believe in God. Okay, watch, watch this here. He says, God is truth. There is no incompatibility between science and religion. Both are seeking the same truth. Powerful, huh? This is this is what people with intelligence believe. But what does Romans what does Paul tell the Roman church? Not many wise, not not many noble, not many mighty are chosen. He didn't say not any. He said not many. He says God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. You would think that of all these intelligent men and women got up and said, we believe in God. It would change the world. No. You know who God's going to use to change the world? Dummies like me, <laughs> dummies like you, uh, average and below average people who have whose lives have been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So don't wait for these people to change the world. God has chosen the foolish and the ignorant and the unwise to, to change the world so that he would get all the glory and he would get all the credit. We don't want to leave the ladies out. Vera Kistiakowski, she's an experimental nuclear physics uh, physicist, MIT and Mount Holyoke College. So she's an, an intelligent person. Listen to what she said. I am satisfied with the existence of an unknowable source of divine order and purpose and do not find this in conflict with being a practicing Christian. So you, you've, got, you've got people on the television telling you all the time that scientists don't believe in God. That's only for the uneducated few. Nothing could be further from the truth. The fool. Not dumb and dumber. People who say, no, there's no God. Okay? There's two primary pe- reasons, and I'm saying this from experience as well as from a biblical perspective, that people choose atheism. Number one, they have been hurt. A lot of people, because their mom died of cancer when they were seven, because they were molested when they were 12, because their dad left their family when they were five, or whatever it may be, or they were exposed to religious hypocrisy, which is so prevalent in this world. Some of the most evil people in this world claim to be Christian. And when you get exposed to all that, you become hurt. But the problem is, is you throw the God out with the bathwater. You see evil people and blame God for them instead of blaming the evil choices of the people. And so here's the thing. You're not going to win these people to Christ by clever arguments. You can have those discussions. I'm not saying not to, but like we saw at 9 o'clock, Rosaria Butterfield, and I'd recommend you read or listen to anything by her. It is friendship and love and the Holy Spirit of God and the Word of God that's going to win people. And you will put your arm around them and say, hey, tell me your story. Tell me wh- you know, what's go- wh- who you are, what you're about. And us being willing to take the time we live in such a busy world that we're going and going and going. We got school, we got kids, we got our job, we got we have to show up to church, we got all these things going that we simply think we do not have time to make friends with lost people. You have to. Eternity is at stake. There are people who will spend eternity in heaven because we took the time to become their friend. There's also people who will spend eternity in hell because we said we didn't have the time. I want you to intentionally be praying about and reaching out to someone in the next week, next two, who's been hurt. Or the second reason is there's people who choose immorality over God. People who choose immorality over God. It says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, doing abominable iniquity. They have actions in their life that are detestable to God, and so therefore there's none that does good. And that's talking about all human race. All of us are that way prior to salvation. Listen to how Jesus elaborates on this. And I mentioned this last week, but this is so important. And this is the judgment. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light. Why? Because it didn't fit their education? No. Because it philosophically wasn't sound? No. Because it scientifically couldn't be proven? No. Because their works were evil. A lot of people say, I've got this lifestyle, I love this lifestyle, but God says this lifestyle is sin. 
So I can either get rid of the sin or get rid of the God who is making me feel guilty. And that is why a lot of people will choose atheism because of that. God looks down from heaven, back to Psalm 53, verse 2, from on the children of man to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. They have, say it with me, all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. You may think back to a time when you were seeking God. You did not start that search for God until God started to search for you. Because of the light of creation, the light of your conscience, and the light of Christ, those three things working on you started the search for God in response to his search for you. First John says, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he first loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God is the great initiator. He is the one that took the initiative to reach out to you, not just individually, but us collectively, to share the gospel with us. Verse 4 says, have those who work evil no knowledge? It's a rhetorical question. Do they know? Do they really know what they're doing? Even as they eat up Christians, as the Romans fed Christians to the lions, as in Nazi Germany when Christians were put alongside of Jews into the gas chambers, did they really, did they really not know? It's a rhetorical answer. Yes, they did know. I believe that because Paul told the Roman church that the law of God is written upon their hearts, that even the most evil person, when they murder someone, has guilt. Now, their guilt may be skewed. It may be squashed down. It may be pushed away. And like First Peter says, their conscience is seared as with a hot iron. You burn something long enough, it becomes callous to where you don't feel anymore. But I believe that people have to go through that process. But they do feel guilt. They do know. They are aware. And again, because they do not know how to deal with, they don't know how to process their guilt, they can either deal with the guilt or make the God who makes them feel guilty go away. Verse 5 says, there they are in great terror. They're shaking. They hate God. They're afraid of God. They want nothing to do with God where there's no terror. This is a God who loves them, that wants to redeem them, and yet their conscience is running from them. And you can even have conversations. They're like, well, what did you mean by that? I'm like, I didn't mean anything by that. And they get real defensive, and we get that way too. And Proverbs tells us why this happens. Proverbs 28.1 says, The wicked flee when no one's chasing them. They, they get all paranoid. and They're like, well, what did you mean by that? And like, holy chill. You know, and they get all anxious. They think that Christians are saying things that we're not saying. They, they think we're feeling things we're not feeling. And we do the same thing. We, one of the things that both sides need to stop doing, whether you're pro-life or pro-choice or you're Christian or atheist or heterosexual or homosexual, whatever it be, you've got to stop the name-calling. The name-calling shuts down all the conversation. Have a loving, compassionate conversation with someone. It says, but the righteous are what? Bold as a lion. When you know that you stand before God, and your sins have been forgiven, and that you're walking with him, and you're walking in his spirit, and you're not perfect, but you're, you're doing your best to serve him, the paranoia goes away. You're not like, well, what did you mean by that? Or I wonder if they're talking about me or whatever. All that, the confidence, the quiet confidence that Isaiah talks about replaces that fear. What does First John say? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because people have not experienced the perfect love of God, they're, they're experiencing terror when there is no terror. It's a loving God trying his best to reach you. They flee when there's no one pursuing them. And what, when you reach out in friendship and you put your arm around someone, you have them over for dinner, you use your, hosp your house for hospitality, and you invite people over, that pushes away the fear so where they can open up their hearts and open up their minds. Back to Psalm 53, it says, Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When God restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice and let Israel be glad. I believe this, like most prophecies, it had a local application to then and there, but also had a future eye towards what was going to happen when Christ returns. And so in this passage right here, we, we see in Romans 11.25, I think it, Paul references this verse here, and he says, I don't want you to be unaware of this mystery. 
In other words, something that God has revealed for us to understand from the past. Brothers, a partial hardening has come upon Israel. Think about that. Israel, I believe, is still God's chosen people. How many Jews, though, have accepted Christ as their Messiah? Very few. Why? Because there is a partial, not a complete, a lot of Jews have come to Christ, but many of them have hardened their hearts, and even God has hardened their heart. That's why it's referred to as a hardening of, has come upon Israel. But notice it's temporary. This partial hardening will only last until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. The fullness of the Gentiles means that when the Jews rejected the gospel, the disciples says, fine, we'll take it to the Gentiles. And they will spread the gospel all over the world, and Israel hardened their hearts against Jesus Christ, but the rest of the world got saved. And Christianity, think about this. Christianity is the only religion in the world that is universal. Buddhism is still primarily an Eastern religion. Yeah, there's Buddhists here and there, and there's more and more temples popping up here, even in Texas. But it is not per predominant anywhere but in where it started, in China, India, that area. Okay, Islam is still basically an Arab religion. It is still strongest where it started. Okay. And you can pick any religion and we'll go through the same process. But Christianity is actually stronger, farther away from where it started than where it started. Christianity has, is, is exploding in South America. It's exploding in Africa. It's exploding in the Philippines and in, in Cambodia. It's in, in, uh, in 1920, 1% of Korea, 1% was Christian. Today it's 44% is Christian. Think about that. Korea, how far away from Israel can you get than Korea? How different? Yeah, Christianity transcends all cultures. It doesn't, it, you know, see, Ara Islam says you really don't understand Islam until you can read Arabic and read the Quran in Arabic. So it's like Arabs have a leg up on us. But Christianity is like, no, it doesn't matter what language, doesn't matter what color you are, Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. Christianity transcends every culture every philosophy, every level of education. So when Jesus comes again and he returns, he's going to restore Israel and salvation will come out of Zion, like Psalm 53, verse 6 says. And Jesus came the first time as a suffering servant, but he's coming the second time as a conquering king. He was meek and mild, the first time and allowed himself to be crucified and that was his exaltation to the throne he didn't put on a golden crown he put on a crown of thorns he didn't put on a robe of white he put on a, a, a robe of mockery he humiliated himself and became obedient to the cross and to obedient unto death even the death on the cross wherefore god has also highly exalted him and given him a name above every name right? so right out of philippians 2 you see this picture right here Jesus came the first time as a suffering servant. He comes the second time as a conquering king. And that's when Isaiah 53 will be fulfilled. And fools will no longer say there is no God. Because what? Every knee shall bow, lost and saved. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. There's, you can confess him now as your Lord and Savior and spend eternity with him in heaven. Or you can confess him then as, lo as Lord of lords and king of kings and then be judged by him. Will he be your savior or will he be your judge? The, the choice is yours. If you've never accepted Christ as your savior, today is the day of salvation. It's not something to put off. It's not something to say, well, I'll think about it, whatever. I don't want you to go to bed tonight without saying, am I truly saved? Do I, have I truly accepted what he did on that cross for the substitute for my sins? If you're saying, well, I'll go to heaven because I'm a good person and I believe in Jesus, you're not going to heaven. It's when you realize I am a sinner and I need a Savior. It's when you realize that when he said it is finished, it was. That this is the full, complete payment. The word it is finished in Greek is one word, totalistai. It means paid in full. What The debt of sin that you owed to God was completely paid by Jesus Christ on the cross. You cannot do one thing to add to it or take away from it. You accept it as it is. The whole book of Galatians, as we studied a couple years ago, was written because the Galatians said, okay, believe the gospel and get circumcised and you'll be saved. And Paul said, oh, you wicked, foolish Galatians who has bewitched you. He used strong language there because they tried to add a little bit to the gospel. There are churches today that says if you believe the gospel and you get baptized, you'll be saved. 
Oh, you foolish so-called Christians. Oh, if you believe the gospel and then you'd be a good person, you can't add anything to. It is complete. It is finished. Totalistic. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for Psalm 53. And Father, I pray that if this does nothing else, it doesn't make us feel superior to atheists or even practical atheists. It humbles us and realizes there's such an overwhelming need in this world to reach the people with the gospel. Help us to have compassion on the lost and not to be uh, condescending to them. Help us to realize they are what we were before we found you, or more accurately, before you found us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the obedience of Jesus to the cross, God in human flesh dying for mankind. We give you the praise and the honor in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. All right, we're going to take some time for question and answers uh, while you may be texting them even now. Um, Let me just encourage you that if you know someone who would benefit from hearing these messages, please invite them. Pray for them and invite them and ask them to come and join you today uh, or next Sunday. All right, let me get to my text here. Here's Here's a question. What are the restored fortunes referred to in verse 6? Is this a reference to salvation? It's reference to the salvation of the soul, yes, but the immediate context is the salvation of Israel, okay? That Israel's fortunes will be restored. Remember, under Solomon, even well, under David, and even more so under Solomon, they had great riches. They were obedient to God for the most part. <clears throat> they were one united nation. They were worshiping God, and God put them a, as a city on a hill for all the nations of the world, literally, literally and figuratively a city on a hill as a bright and shining light. Even from 100 miles away, you could see the city of Jerusalem lit up at night. So they literally were the light of the world back then. And he was saying that, pointing to that, to saying, I want you to be the light, not just of your wealth and your riches. I want you to now take this light of the gospel to the world. So prophetically, it's referring to the restoration of the nation of Israel. All right, good question there. All right, somebody sent me a picture, good picture. All right, any other questions? You can raise your hand or text it or whatever. It always happens to say, okay, none others, and then we pray, and then I get a question. Reggie, why does God love us that much? That's a great question. And here, the best answer I can give you is from Scripture. First John says twice, God is love. Okay? Now, I've, I've, I've said this before, but this will answer your question. And this, you need to, if you've heard this before, it's good, because it will help you be able to repeat this to somebody else. God cannot be love unless there's someone to love. And I used to teach, and this is wrong, that's why God made man, so he'd have someone to love. No. Did God become love once he made us? No, he was eternally love. So that means before the angels, before mankind, God was love. Who was he loving? The Father was loving the Son. The Son was loving the Spirit. The Spirit was loving the Father. They were the Holy Trinity loving one another. And God was love before the foundations of the world. They were doing the, what's called the divine dance. They were loving one another before the foundations of the world. And so therefore, he didn't create man so he'd have one, someone to love. He created someone to share in the love of the Trinity. So that, that, that's a concept that in, in I've been saved since I was nine, but just came to me in the last couple of years just listening to people much wiser than I am. So therefore, God looked down upon us and loved us because that's who he is. You see, when it's like I quoted earlier, we love him because he first loved us. So our love is a response. When we love others, it's because God loved us and it flows through us towards them. But when God does it, it's just an outflowing of who he is. And he's doing what just comes natural to him. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so it's something that the prophets and the angels looked into and said, wow, this is crazy because God didn't die for the fallen angels, did he? No, they're doomed to eternity, but God died for fallen man, which is pretty amazing because we were created in his image. All right. Well, let's let's uh, let's stand.